Well, thanks very much for joining me. Let me start by asking you um, if you could explain the, the reasoning, the logic behind the so-called pivot, the, the rebalancing of uh, American uh, uh, attention toward, towards Asia, what, what's the rationale that drives it? Let me say by almost any measure, and particularly at the level of economic performance, uh, commercial potential, I think that there is a very broad and deep acknowledgement that the history of the 21st century is going to be written in the Asian Pacific region. You know, the most dynamic economies, largest growing middle classes, tremendous potential for prosperity and an absolutely unique American role. Now, we have always been engaged in Asia. And in fact, one of the most important features of the peace and prosperity that has allowed for this tremendous rise over the course of the last several decades has been the U.S. presence. But in the last 15 or so years, we have been so principally engaged in the dramas playing out in the Middle East and South Asia. I think many in Asia uh, questioned whether the United States would have the wit and wisdom to recognize the importance of Asia. And I think what we have simply tried to do is to acknowledge publicly that this is where our destiny lies. We will have important responsibilities and, 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 and critical challenges in the Middle East and South Asia. But to a very large extent, we are expending capital. We are uh, using national resources of prestige, blood, and treasure uh, in a very difficult set of environments in the Middle East and South Asia, where in Asia you have the potential to put more money, if you will, back in the bank. And that, I think, has been uh, the principal impetus behind, behind what I think has been long overdue, a greater focus on Asia. How much and, and in what way has the rise of China shaped this notion of the pivot? I think some, sometimes uh, there has been a mistaken assumption that our focus has been somehow aimed at China, when in fact one of the principal beneficiaries of much more intense engagement in Asia has been China. Much higher diplomatic engagement, a clear desire on the part of the United States and other countries to work with China in partnership to deal with common challenges like the global economy, uh, climate change, you name it. Um, I think if you look and scan the history of uh, previous experiences where you've had a rising power and that, like China and an established power like the United States, it's often the case that the rising power feels as if the existing state has not given uh, the uh, comer more space and respect in the international community. I don't think that's the case with China. It's been the United States who's been strongly supportive of uh, incorporating China into global institutions and encouraging uh, the Chinese role. And so I, I uh, clearly think that China is a giant factor in the foreign policy of the United States and will continue to be. But this focus on Asia is not, as some have suggested, some sort of containment plan that's simplistic and wrong. Every single state in Asia, and this is the key, wants a better relationship with China. So it doesn't make any sense that we would construct a strategy that somehow doesn't take into consideration that critical fact. What do you make of this more assertive, muscular Chinese approach that we've seen in the last couple of years uh, in a lot of their external relations, both in tone and in substance. What do, make, what do you make of that? Well, China's growing rapidly. I think there are many inside the country that have argued, look, we've, we've, we've backed off, we've stood on the sidelines, we're the victors of um, uh, the most recent economic difficulties, and we should declare our um, new stature, and we should also indicate when we're prepared uh, to stand firm in our, on our views and our uh, positions. I think there's also some nationaliz nationalism afoot and probably uh, a sense of, of, of global um, aggrievement occasionally on various uh, issues. I think it's important on the part of the United States to do several things. First and foremost, 
is to make clear through our performance that we're not declining, that we are going to be an active and strong participant in the Asia Pacific region for decades to come. Second, to show China all due appropriate respect, to seek their counsel, to work with them as partners. But lastly, to recognize that in, in, in fact China does respect determination, strength, strategy, and that has to be part of our overarching approach. The Obama administration took office with what some people have described as a kind of pretty accommodating attitude towards Beijing. Secretary Clinton made China the first stop on her first big trip, uh, talked about downplaying human rights, the president held off meeting the Dalai Lama, and then there's no question that there has been a toughening in the, the way the U.S. has dealt with China. What accounts for the, the shift? How much of it is in Washington? How much of it is behavior in Beijing that shaped responses here? Well, you know, I th my honest assessment is that probably too much has been made of what are really very modest and small course corrections. I think um, the administration was very clear about um, a desire to work with China uh, from the start. It continues to undertake that proposition. Uh, clearly at the outset we faced enormous economic and commercial challenges. You know, economy was almost in free fall. And that, you know, on an international stage limits some of your options more generally. I think it's also the case that, that in a few instances, like in the South China Sea and elsewhere, China was asserting itself and um, uh, acknowledging uh, their role as a global power. And I think it's only natural that there are going to be areas where the United States and China rub up against one another. Th th there is an inherent tension in certain aspects of our interactions, so we're going to both cooperate and compete. And I think the more important issue is not how the Obama administration has toughened up or whether China was, uh, you know, we were disappointed in, with, you know, China's initial approach from the Obama administration. I think a better way to think about this is that invariably um, that this is a relationship that will have equal measures, cooperation, and competition, and a degree of um, tension is probably inevitable and probably healthy as well. Some people have described the U.S. approach uh, as a kind of almost like a hedging strategy, engaging with China but also strengthening relationships with other countries who are themselves smaller and perhaps uneasy about being dominated by China, that it's, it's sort of two parts of the same equation. Is, is that a fair description, do you think? My own sense is that our strategy in Asia is profoundly multifaceted, and we want better relations with all states in the region as a whole, um, and that uh, we've built stronger relationships, for instance, with a country like Burma, Myanmar. Um, although others have sought to portray this as somehow um, being related to China. In fact, in many circumstances, these situations have their own internal logic and dynamic. Our challenging relationship with Burma existed decades before China's rise. And so I, I think it's important not to view everything in Asia through such a lens. And we uh, expect uh, a good relationship between China and its neighbors. And in fact, one of the things that we've sought to do is to engage very actively in multilateral institutions like the East Asia Summit and the ASEAN Regional Forum, where all countries are together. And so there's not a group, you know, sort of siding against the other. We sit at a table together where hopefully we can take on common issues in a, in a common way. You've got a leadership transition now in China. How confident are you that at the top, Chinese leaders are seriously committed to effectively managing the relationship? And to what extent do you think the very critical voices that are in the Chinese press and in the Chinese uh, internet world and so on uh, don't reflect what the top leadership feels? Well, look, you know, 
the debates in China, in fact, are becoming more pluralist. In the past, it was possible to say this is the line and everyone would take it. That's not happening as much anymore. People debate it even after decisions are taken. All that being said, we've had an enormous amount of interaction. President Biden's now spent really dozens of hours. Uh, Vice President Biden, sorry, ha has spent uh, dozens of hours with Vice President uh, Xi. And I think our sense is that this is a person who's committed to continuing a strong relationship between China and uh, the United States. We, Secretary Clinton made, met with Li Keqiang um, in Beijing a week and a half ago, and he was very clear and firm on his determination to keep U.S.-China relations on a steady course. And so I think we have some confidence that the leadership will follow through accordingly. But uh, I think we also believe that there will be debates that swirl about how China should position itself globally, what kind of positions it will take. I think we are seeing, for instance, on issues related to sovereignty from their perspective, a very tough and in some respects unyielding set of positions that have been animated by nationalist sentiment. Uh, and we see that quite clearly. Um, still, we think it is profoundly and deeply in China's interest to maintain a good relationship with the United States. And we think cooler heads will likely prevail uh, in that assessment uh, during the next leadership cycle. How worried should people be about the tensions between China and Japan? And to what extent is there any reason to worry that if things got nastier, the U.S., by virtue of its security relationship with Japan, could get drawn in? Am I worried that this will trigger a, a conflict? Uh, no, not in the current context. But I am worried, and I think we're worried, that the persistent high-level tensions are eating away at Sino-Japanese goodwill, at enormous um, linkages that have developed on um, people to people, on culture, on business. And um, it is stirring negative feelings on both sides. This is not um, uh, you know, bad feelings, anxiety, um, disappointment is not uh, felt just on one side, it's both sides. And so we've urged again here for dialogue between Japan and China uh, to realize there's a larger game here, which is a recognition that Asia is the cockpit of the global economy right now with profound European slowdown and still uh, the United States digging itself out, that we can scarcely afford such a uh, uh, problem uh, on these territorial matters. And we're hoping that over the course of the next few weeks that the situation cools down. But we recognize that damage has been done and we're worried about it. Let me ask you quickly about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP. How central is that to the whole U.S. focus on Asia? Asia looks for the United States to do several things, a strong security commitment, uh, diplomatic strategic engagement, perhaps more than anything else, our economic uh, uh, and commercial role. Now clearly the President's articulated that we want to double exports. We're on track to do that uh, in Asia. One of the ways that we can create a clearer and more level playing field uh, is through fair, balanced, high quality trade agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now, just a couple of years ago, people said, well, the United States did not have a trade strategy. We passed the Korea Free Trade Agreement. We have some other bilateral uh, agreements. And the TPP is an architecture that other countries now want to join Japan in uh, considering it. Obviously, Canada and Mexico have already decided to join. This potentially could be a groundbreaking initiative. We're in a difficult period, lots of, you know, you have, you have a leadership uh, change clearly in China, which you've already pointed to, Mike, but also a number of countries in Asia and the United States are experiencing elections and leadership changes. That makes uh, these issues both of territorial matters sensitive, but also trade very sensitive. One of the concepts that I've seen discussed in relation to the, the pivot or rebalancing on the military side is this notion of air-sea battle. Can you explain what that is and how that fits into the bigger picture? I think the shorthand is how the United States 
Air Force and Navy can work more effectively together to support long-term American interests in which power projection, naval force are paramount. In many respects, it is meant to be the corollary of various military doctrines that have been about nation building, post-conflict reconstruction, counterinsurgency. It's sort of a natural reaction, in my view, to reclaim the natural naval uh, tendencies and approaches that have animated American military policy for decades, centuries, really. With the election coming up here, um, the Romney campaign has accused President Obama of being soft on China. How would you distinguish the president's approach to China from what you can understand of Romney's approach? We're discouraged at the State Department to talk too much about politics. All I can say is that the strength of American foreign policy in Asia has generally been the bipo bipartisan quality of our uh, engagement. And there is in fact, general agreement among the Asian advisors around uh, Governor Romney and uh, our administration about what are the key foundations of our approach. It is almost always the case that China comes in for criticism, proposals, and the like during an election campaign. And then thereafter, the, the, the victor tends to adjust policies accordingly given to the realities of the day. So I, I, I think that President Obama has followed a strong principled set of strategies and approaches uh, uh, to, uh, to China. I'd stand by them. I would think that anyone um, uh, facing comparable uh, challenges would make approximately the same decisions.